Okay, um, I'll take over. Um, I'll start and we'll introduce you and Dr. Wilson. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Ying Zeng, the Director of Asian Initiatives at Western Michigan University's Hennig Institute for Global Education. Uh, I also serve as the Director of Timothy Light Center for Chinese Studies. Welcome to Timothy Light Center's webinar series of Spring 2021. Today, we are honored to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Wang Xi, Professor of History at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. First, I would like to introduce two of my colleagues, Dr. Victor Xiong, Professor of History from WMU's College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Xiong will introduce Dr. Wang Xi to us. And Dr. Brian Wilson, Professor of American Religious History and formal Associate Director and Interim Director of WMU's American Studies Program. Dr. Wilson will lead the discussion after Dr. Wang's talk. Xiong Lao Shi, please. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, good morning, everybody. And first, uh, I would like to start this uh, and lecture today with a quotation from a famous and uh, philosopher, Jorge Santayana. And those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. That says a lot about the importance of history and the history department. So don't forget. Now today we're going to deal with the special type of history that U.S.-China relations, especially China's views of the United States. So um, those relations can date back seriously to the 19th century. And for example, the gold rush. So a lot of Chinese laborers who arrived in San Francisco and also uh, and a large number of Chinese laborers who participated or play a crucial role in completing a trans transcontinental railroad. And then that's give rise to the Exclusion Act, 1892. So Ch Chinese people in this country became the most targeted people and of all ethnicities. So, you know, so nobody were treated like that. And not the blacks, not Indian and Native Americans. So Chinese people are not allowed to immigrate into this country. That's based on race and ethnicity. Never happened before. And later on, and the same treat, treatment will be given to the Japanese in uh, 1924. Okay. And of course, the Americans also done a lot of good things for, for China, don't forget. There are the great Americans who came to China, who set up orphanages, who set up hospitals, universities. And, and at the time of the, the, the Boxer Protocol, okay, 1902 or 1901, whatever, so, uh, and uh, the Americans had their cut of this uh, tremendous amount of money as uh, reparations were indemnity to those imperialist power. However, the Americans, and not long afterwards, used the same money to fund Chinese students to study in the United States. And also they set up hospitals and universities and so on. So, and today, and I think it's, uh, it's all in the past. So we're going to have a look at uh, uh, the uh, China's relations with the United States on an entirely new um, footing. So we are pleased to have uh, Dr. Wang Xi as uh, our speaker. And he may be not that well known in the United States, but he's extremely well known in China. And he is the student of Eric Foner. Okay. And who's Eric? Uh, Eric Foner, he's a big shot in American studies. Okay. He's a winner of the uh, Bancroft Prize, which is a very famous prize for in historical and, and monographs, and more importantly, the Pulitzer Prize. Okay. And also he's the president of the three national associations of historical studies, including the, the Holy Grail, the AHA, that is uh, American Hist Historical Association. And Wang Xi served as uh, uh, the translator of uh, Foner's two books into Chinese, which became bestsellers in China. And Wang Xi is also a an, an professor of history at the Peking University for more than a decade. 
concurrently, of course. And and what is Peking University? Why isn't called a Beijing University? Because they, they thought Peking is more prestigious. Um, I, I don't know. I'm not quite sure about that. And uh, uh, Wang Xi also led the effort in bringing about awareness uh, concerning American studies in China. So Peking University itself, I, I consider the greatest university in China in the humanities and the social sciences. Yeah, uh, people would argue Tsinghua is better. Yeah, Tsinghua has more money, of course, but their humanities and uh, social sciences still have a long way to go. And Wang Xi also a Changjiang scholar, as you see in the flyer. Changjiang scholar, uh, this is funded by uh, the endowment set up by Li Kaixin, who uh, was the richest man in Asia. Now, this endowment is extremely prestigious and almost like a high status in, in, in the world of the, uh, the humanities and, and sciences and social sciences. Um, uh, currently, um, Professor Wang Xi is a professor of history at Indiana University of Pennsylvania where he also served as chair before. So his English is a reason with understandably is excellent. Okay. And also is a past editor of a, an academic journal called the Chinese Historical Review. So, um, so we are honored to have uh, Professor Wang Xi to serve as our speaker today. Okay. I'll, okay. Uh, uh, now here is the Professor Wang Xi. So. So you can you can take over. Okay. Um, thank you, Victor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chen, um, for this warm introduction. Uh, I'm very honored to be here today. I just want to make sure everyone can hear me well um, because I'm doing this in my office. Um, I was just had a pleasant chat with uh, Dr. Wilson, you know, about our daring financial situation here at IUP. I think that's the challenge that has been faced by so many universities in the United States. And uh, and uh, as uh, Victor Shun, Dr. Shun uh, says that I, in the past 12 years, I uh, sort of have done something like a, a no one has done before, that is uh, to teach transnationally. Uh, American history, uh, splitting my time uh, between Peking University and the IUP. Uh, IUP has given me a sort of a uh, leave, a uh, half year academic leave, so I can teach, I could teach at the Beijing University uh, uh, in spring semester, and every fall semester, I would return to IUP to teach my courses. Um, my training, as Dr. Shun mentions, is American history, specifically 19th century uh, U.S. history. I uh, got my PhD at the Columbia University dissertation, was directed by Eric Foner. And uh, uh, I really, in my teaching, I cover three uh, areas, uh, African-American history, uh, constitutional history of the United States, and uh, um, Civil War and Reconstruction. Uh, my dissertation is about the uh, establishment, the enforcement, and the ultimate failure of the 15th Amendment uh, in the 19th century. Right. Um, Dr. Shaw mentioned that uh, I am the translator of a number of Fulner's book. Uh, I think uh, two of them are widely used uh, uh, in the United States, and graduate school and the undergraduate studies. One is uh, his uh, masterpiece called Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution. Um, that is, uh, uh, I just finished that translation uh, uh, last year, so it will be coming out uh, this year. And uh, two of early translations, one is a story of American freedom, which is I regarded as a sort of a representation of new American history. Uh, that was uh, published, uh, translation was published in 2002. And uh, then his uh, thicker, el elaborated version of, uh, of the story of American freedom is uh, Give Me Liberty and American History. It's a two volume textbook. Uh, so um, someone would say that this uh, two 
story of American freedom and uh, uh, giving liberty uh, have sort of uh, revised the older Chinese version of Chinese understanding of American history because Vonner himself represents the new generation. I, I, I will talk about this in my talk. This is a special relationship between uh, uh, American Americanists and the Chinese Americanists. It's a special bond, a special connections, and it, it's a, such an interesting story. So without further ado, uh, I will uh, uh, dip into my talk. So I'm going to try my share uh, uh, here. Uh, okay. Uh, Screen shared contents. Let's see. I should have my uh, PowerPoint here. Okay, I cannot find. Seems okay. Sorry for this. Screen one. Okay, got it. Got it. It seems a little bit slow. Uh, I clicked on share, but okay, got it. Now, can you see my screen? It's still uploading. Oh, it's still uploading. Okay, okay, all right. Um, now it's just... okay. Very good. Excellent. I will put. It. Oh, I see. It is the uh, it is the mechanic issue? It's not on my side. Okay, all right. Oh, okay. Um, it's not the slideshow yet. Right, right, because the machine, I think it's it's the computer. Oh, it's coming up. Okay, expanding panel. All right, it will take probably a few seconds. Um, I think it's showing your the end of the slide, so you'll have to um, uh, click back to the beginning of your presentation. Oh, I see, I see. All right, yeah. but now you can see this, right? Yep. All right. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Um, the, um, the, my, my, my title is actually is not as uh, broad as uh, uh, Victor Xiong has introduced. I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, really the entire history of the US-China relationship. I'm going to just focus on one aspect. The title of the talk is America Seen Through Chinese Lessons, Lenses, uh, Lenses, and uh, the Research and the Training and the Teaching of U.S. History in China from 1949 to 2019. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of background of why I'm interested in this subject, um, partially because I'm a trained Americanist uh, who has taught both in the United States and in China, and uh, uh, and also uh, has been involved in helping the development of uh, American studies in China. So I find this is an enormously uh, interesting and intriguing aspect of U.S.-China relations. Uh, the first messenger that had brought the knowledge of the United States to China was an American vessel called uh, the Empress of China. And uh, they, um, I, today I don't know where uh, that we could find the replica of the vessel, but the Empress of China uh, uh, went to from her tribal settlement from Philadelphia to uh, Canton, which is today known as Guangzhou. And so that is uh, the, the, the vessel brought the knowledge of the existence of the United States to the Chinese. So the Chinese first called the new country as a flowering flag country, Huachibo, and then later 
uh, settled with the name Meiguo, beautiful country. That's the Chinese for uh, the United States of America. So that was 1784, but it would take nearly 200 years for American studies to be established as a legitimate field of academic inquiry uh, in China. Well, the China, China's learning about America has been a very long and a complex story, which had made uh, many different uh, turns and involved many different uh, groups of individuals who had uh, carried with them with a various agenda. Well, the process has been shaped by China's domestic politics and its relations with the United States and outside world that had also you know, the Chinese studies of America had also shaped the Chinese perceptions and sometimes misperceptions of the United States and the different historical times. All of this makes this story very intriguing and important. Why were the Chinese interested in learning about America? How was the Chinese learning of the United States ultimately evolved as an academic field, what impact did such learning generate? For me, this, uh, uh, this import, these are important questions. They are important not only because they demonstrate the tension and the politics involved in knowledge creation in humanities in an international and a transnational setting, but also because they reflect how historians try to find a balance between knowledge and the politics. And uh, uh, so, um, as I mentioned, uh, that uh, it's, uh, uh, this has been a, a long story. I mean, the, the, the development of China's American studies. But knowing the limits of my own knowledge, uh, in this talk, I will save myself from the undue burden and embarrassment by addressing Chinese American studies from late Qing to the present. So I will just focus on the period of PRC. As you can see from the slides, I roughly divided the entire story into three periods, the late Qing from 1784, the first Chinese text of American history uh, was published in 1836 by an American missionary. And then there was the Opium War. After that, there was a huge wave of learning about the West. And uh, Republic of China, uh, uh, 1911 to 1949, China did not have a territorial and administrative integrity because of the war with Japan. So there was no genuine uh, development of American studies. So the People's Republic of China, which was founded in 1949 and the last year uh, or two, uh, uh, two years ago, which is a celebrated 70th uh, uh, anniversary, and uh, relatively had a more stable, more complete uh, uh, territorial and administrative uh, uh, integrity. At the same time, it had its imposed, uh, imposed a high ideological conformity. And during the 70 years of the People's Republic of China, we also witnessed the drastic shifts, uh, turns in both domestic politics and the China's relations with the outside world, especially with the United States. For some of you who watch news this morning would realize that another a very big uh, turn of the China uh, uh, U.S.-China relationship will be coming in the next few years. Uh, so um, I divide the uh, 70 years of PRC history uh, in, uh, you know, divide the Chinese studies of America in this last 70 years into three periods. The, uh, the first is uh, 1949 to 1979. Uh, second is 1979 to 2001, and the uh, third period is from 2001 to 2019. Um, um, now, the reason I'm doing that is because uh, each period 
uh, is different from others in terms of a research environment, uh, research motivation, institutional setup, scholarly output, and impact. And uh, um, what I'm, uh, well, uh, I think I'm going to offer a brief overview of how Chinese study of U.S. history, since I'm trained as a historian, so, uh, I mean, the American study is a broad concept in China, and the, uh, the study of U.S. history is one of the most important components of this very large program. Uh, but what I'm truly interested in is to try to explore the process of knowledge creation and production in humanities and the factors uh, that have shaped uh, its course. Uh, we all know that in the United States in the 1970s, uh, you know, during the second women's rights movement, there was uh, a, a, a very high sounding slogan that is, what is personal is political. And I want to borrow that to say, what is, a, what is a historical uh, is a political. So uh, the first period started in 1949, ended in uh, 1979, and uh, I used the arch enemy uh, to uh, try to characterize the mentality of the Chinese scholars. Uh, and their research, their scholarly production uh, on the United States and interpretations of U.S. history. And of course, um, this is from the very beginning of the People's Republic that uh, politics, both domestic and international, has sealed the defeat of American studies in China uh, for this phase. The communist victory over the U.S. backed nationalists in the mainland, PRC's political alliance with the Soviet Union, McCarthyism, and the who lost the China debate in the United States, and the onset of a Korean War, all occurring between 1949 and 1954, placed China and the United States on the opposite sides of the international politics with each perceiving the other as nothing but enemy. So given this background, uh, scholarship has to be political. Politicization was therefore the birthmark of a PRC's American studies, and it was shown in the first wave of a Chinese historian's work of U.S. history on U.S. history published in the 1950s. And the first major uh, publications of the Chinese study of U.S. history was published in 1951 in a journal called uh, History Education, uh, which was the, uh, which has been the longest running history journal in PRC. And it published a number of articles, 10 research-based articles, all focusing on the imperialism of the United States and the mistreatment of Chinese labor uh, 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 in the United States. So politicization was not only the hindrance for the development of, of the field. Human resources and the institutional setup uh, uh, were uh, equally unfavorable uh, for the uh, development of the field. The number of so-called Americanists basically means those who received academic training in the United States uh, uh, in China was no more than 10, so tiny little group of Americanists. Most prominent uh, in this group uh, uh, was, uh, uh, okay, here. Most prominent in this group is uh, Professor uh, Huang Saoxiang, and uh, here, uh, Professor Huang Saoxiang. And the three others, uh, Professor Liu Xuyi, Professor Yangsen Mao, Professor Liu, Professor Yangsen Mao, and Professor Ping Zheng. All, all of them were trained in the United States, either as a historian or as a sociologist, but uh, uh, they returned to China before 1949. So they became the founding generation of a PRC's China Studies Program, uh, uh, China's American Studies Program. Now, they were 
but for for them, this small group of scholars would then later become the founders of a PRC's American Studies in 1980. So for the first 30 years, and their job uh, uh, was not really to train graduate students, and because there, there was no graduate program in uh, American history in China. In 1950s, uh, Chinese uh, higher education system had a major uh, reorganization following the Soviet model. That means to divide the universities into two, largely two categories. One is known as the comprehensive university system. That would include the major uh, universities and with the teacher's college. And another group is a specifically Soviet model uh, so to put uh, colleges of uh, science, engineering, agriculture together as a group. And in those universities, the second group, uh, no humanities, social sciences or fields would be taught, will be focusing on purely on science and natural science. And in the comprehensive universities, uh, that history will be taught. But within history category, that there are two major fields, uh, um, Chinese history and world history. But world history is a tiny little field. So American history is placed under uh, under world history. So it's almost like a, a, if a, we can describe this as a hierarchical system, then you have a history, then Chinese history, under which you have a world history, you know, as a sideline, under world history, then you have American history. So uh, American history had simply no institutional uh, setup uh, for uh, for its uh, uh, development, and there no uh, resources there. But this does not mean um, um, the tiny little group of American Americanists had no impact. Uh, as a matter of fact, because of the uh, particular a feature of Chinese higher education and the entire national educational system. Now, these historians, especially uh, Professor Huang, uh, she was the leading uh, scholar in American history, played a very major role in uh, producing knowledge of United States history uh, for Chinese audience. Uh, when I say the special feature, I mean, the uh, Chinese educational system is a centralized textbooks. The production of the textbooks were centralized. And, uh, uh, and all teachers, uh, high school teachers, and uh, when they teach history uh, classes, they would have a concentrated preparation of standardized uh, textbooks. Even the contents that individual faculty member uh, 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 you know, deliver in every classroom would be standardized. So that basically creates a official version, uh, creates a possibility for one official version of a history to be delivered throughout the China, in all high schools and the colleges. And that is where that uh, uh, Professor Huang made her most impactful uh, uh, um, uh, inference. Two of her books are published in uh, uh, early 1950s. One is a short history of the United States in 1953, a history of the early developments of the United States from 18, 1492 to 1823. Now, these two books, first of all, they put together over 800 pages. So it was a really a monumental study. And uh, Professor Wang himself uh, came to the United States in 1940s, enrolled at the Columbia University as a master's student. And so she started uh, with a number of uh, uh, Columbia historians during the daytime and the night school and the nighttime, and she would join the, uh, uh, what is the union schools in Manhattan, where he got to know uh, uh, Professor Friedrich Fulner, who was a leading Marxist the historian in the United States of labor history. And so she became acquainted uh, with uh, Friedrich Fonger. Uh, by the way, as Dr. Xiong mentioned, uh, I'm a student of Eric Fonger. Eric Fonger is the nephew of Friedrich Fonger. 
a very interesting story. Fred Foner and his twin brother, Jack Foner, were both uh, 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 well-known historians uh, early on. Uh, Jack Foner was Eric Foner's father. Um, and so um, the, um, Professor Huang then returned to China and became a professor in the different places. First, the Academy of uh, Chinese Social Science, later at the Peking University. Now, we let's take a look at uh, some of her uh, uh, arguments. Uh, this is a translation from her short history. For example, he would, uh, you know, in this short history, would uh, she would offer uh, an overview of American history. This is how she. Uh, argue about American Revolution. The American Revolution was a landmark event that had inspired other revolutionary movements around the world and set up a precedent for the liberation of the colonial peoples. But because of an American proletariat had not yet been formed by then, so the bourgeois class, bourgeoisie class, had stolen the outcome of the revolution. So that's uh, our revolution. The Constitution as the law to protect the exploitative classes. It provided the bourgeoisie with a powerful state machinery and helped to consolidate its social order. Only under the pressure of Jefferson and the French Revolution had the bourgeoisie made some concessions by supplementing it with the Bill of Rights. Uh, that's on the Constitution. Civil War. The Civil War was by nature a bourgeois revolution. It was a struggle between slavery and the slave labor, and it was America's second revolution. Of course, they, uh, she was not the person, uh, first person to use the, uh, such concept. This uh, second American revolution was a concept that was first articulated by uh, Charles Field. Um, uh, reconstruction was a two-line struggle between the progress of such as Thaddeus uh, Stevens and Charles Sumner and the reactionaries. Lincoln was a centrist. Uh, uh, even though he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, he was always inclined to, to make compromises with the uh, reactionaries. So uh, it's about Lincoln. And then New Deal is a big uh, topic. The progressiveness of New Deal was uh, quite limited to the fact that it had prevented the United States moving toward fascism. Franklin Roosevelt's reform contained no elements of socialism and were by nature not different from German and Italian fascism. Now, given this uh, quotation, of course, uh, and I've read uh, both books in great uh, detail, paid close attention, and uh, uh, I. I find, I, I, I can see that uh, uh, Professor Huang uh, was trying to introduce a methodology, the Marxist, the Marxist Leninist sort of way uh, of looking at American history. So there were two uh, key words uh, in, throughout her uh, book. One is the capitalism. So she was reading American history as a history of capitalism. So the United States was defined as a capitalist country. That's a very standard political uh, definition uh, you see in China. Another is a class struggle. So always to try to find this uh, uh, duality uh, that the proletariat versus the bourgeoisie. That is also a uh, very uh, standard. And uh, Professor Huang um, and uh, used of course, she started in the United States uh, in her autobiography. She would say she brought a lot of books back to China in 1940s. Now, this is a, a, a I look at her footnotes, and she relied on mostly a number of what she called progressive uh, uh, Americanists. And uh, some, of, some of the figures are now completely forgotten by contemporary. U.S. Americanists, but they were very well known in China. Their books were translated into Chinese, were read by the first and second generation of Chinese students of American history. William Foster, strictly speaking, was not academic. Uh, uh, he was uh, um, at one time 
was the general secretary of the American Communist Party. And, uh, uh, but he wrote uh, uh, um, a lot of books on the history of labor, history of uh, uh, American Negroes, and the history of the Communist Party, and the history of the United States. And here we have a Fulner, uh, uh, Philip Fulner, Professor Philip Fulner, and Fulner has uh, uh, produced more than 100 or nearly 100 books, authored or edited a, a major uh, figure in the history of American labor movement. James Allen and uh, a lot of his works on reconstruction. And I think the last person probably is the most well known is Herbert Abathaker. And uh, who toured at Berkeley and Princeton. And uh, he's, uh, uh, an, he was a major figure in the study of uh, uh, African American history. So all of them, their works were translated into Chinese, it became the first major source uh, for Chinese uh, Americanists. So Professor Huang's book, although uh, was written as monographs used in colleges, but her points of view, her conclusions were adapted uh, into high school textbooks and the college general history books. And that had been read from 19, late 1950s until early 1980s. So she was uh, uh, regarded really as the single author who had influenced at least one generation of uh, uh, Chinese students, uh, uh, either studying American history or studying history or world history, and also uh, uh, went to uh, the public uh, uh, knowledge. Now, during the first period of time, the only, you know, direct contact uh, between the Chinese Americans and the American Americans was the visit of W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois as uh, a towering figure in uh, uh, American history, American sociology, and uh, but he was uh, uh, isolated. He was uh, uh, blacklisted. And uh, um, for a short period of time, the State Department of the United States uh, uh, opened the possibility for him to travel abroad in 1959. So Du Bois seized the opportunity and to uh, uh, visit the Eastern European countries and then China. So this is the image that Du Bois came to China. He was welcomed to China as a state guest, not as a uh, as an Americanist, but as a, a peace fighter, because Du Bois was a member of a World Council of Peace. Uh, um, and so he gave only talk, one talk, at the Peking University in 1959, but his talk was not about American history, rather about Pan-Africanism. He was calling a greater unity and alliance between People's Republic of China and Africa. Um, so, uh, how do we conclude this uh, first period of uh, study? And uh, uh, Du Bois visited China in 1959, 20 years later, in 1979, that uh, John Hope Franklin, uh, uh, a leading American historian at that time, was also the first African American uh, uh, historian who was elected as the president of the American Historical Association. So he uh, came to China and uh, with the mission to resume the scholarly connections between China and the United States. And because of 1979 was also a year that the United States and China normalized their diplomatic relations. Uh, this is a quite interesting, John Hope Franklin, and uh, uh, in his uh, autobiography, Europe to America, published in 2005. And uh, he described, he used the four pages uh, to describe his experience in China. And he, I think he visited China for three weeks. And he wrote, America's picture was not rosy, but one needed the fact, which many of them lacked, them means the Chinese Americanists, in order to make an appraisal of just how cloudy it was. It was also personally painful for, to see how far my Chinese colleagues were 
uh, were from what I valued as the professional scholars' ethos of ecclesiastical interest in and study the objectivity before the fact. I could only hope that in due course they would be able to achieve a broad understanding and appreciation of every facet of the ongoing African American struggle for equality and tolerance for so long wanting in the American spiritual as well as in the American practice. What this reflection uh, that uh, uh, Professor Franklin uh, was making is because uh, she, uh, because he was giving, he gave four lectures in Beijing and they find that his Chinese audience were more interested in American government's racial policy and the radical obedient uh, uh, facets of a black movement, such as the Black Panthers and the Black Muslims, rather than in the history of NAACP, the Urban League or the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Franklin was also more troubled uh, by the fact that his hosts knew, I uh, quote, knew Herbert Appetiker, but almost nothing about the Black history movement. O. Carter G. Woodson, Charles Wellesley, and the rifle Logan, these were major African American historians in the United States. Franklin was shocked uh, when his Chinese colleagues told him that Martin Luther King Jr. had asserted that the United States should reform itself by adopting the principle of communism and socialism. That's why, so I give you this background that you can uh, sort of uh, appreciate uh, uh, Franklin's uh, deep concern and, and, and anxiety. But Franklin became a very interesting figure uh, in, the, uh, in China's study of the United States because uh, he came in 1979, the year that uh, U.S.-China diplomatic relationships were normalized, and also the year that the uh, American History Research Association of China was uh, established. Uh, this uh, AHRAC, uh, uh, the, the name, actually the English title of this organization in Chinese is called the Mei Guoshi Yuan Jiu Hui. But in uh, the English title, American History Research Association of China, was actually named by John Hope Franklin. And uh, so uh, the two events fundamentally altered the research condition and, uh, of uh, uh, Chinese Americanists. And there were also uh, other developments on thought liberation, which is the Chinese. Uh, saying about the gradual liberation of ideological control in China after 1978 with the open up policy. And uh, so China began to learn about the West, the United States. There was also resumption of uh, uh, graduate programs in China. You know, uh, for much of the early period, there was no graduate training. And uh, so starting from 1978, and uh, our master's training program resumed in China. University reopened uh, with a national entrance examination in 1977. I believe uh, uh, our friend, Dr. Xiong, was one of the uh, uh, winners uh, of the national entrance examination, you know, national number one in English language. And uh, um, uh, doctoral program resumed uh, in 1981. So this is a, a really provide uh, a institutional change to allow uh, the first group, the first generation of American leaders begin to seize the opportunity to train the second or third generation of Chinese American uh, American leaders. And the very most very crucial was the resumption of a bilateral academic uh, uh, exchange. And uh, this is, I think it's very important for the development of a, a field of academic inquiry, uh, especially in the transnational setting. So a number of uh, Americanists uh, came to China and uh, um, 
you know, to uh, do exchange. Uh, I mentioned the Philip Fonder, he brought uh, more than 100 books. And uh, uh, Herman Berman uh, from University of uh, Minnesota. And these were first the group uh, of Americanists who came to uh, China to teach and, uh, and the Nankai University. And now here is a very interesting because uh, American historians as a specialists uh, who uh, uh, would have their own, you know, uh, field of studies. So whoever uh, uh, that came to China in 19, uh, early 1980s would help to fund the, uh, the program, you know, like Nankai University, Northeast uh, uh, Normal uh, uh, University would develop programs like uh, American Labor Movement, American West, and uh, all, uh, immigration history of the uh, United States. So um, the translations, publications flourished. Um, you know, the, the first generation, second generation would include those historians who were trained in China and the Soviet Union. There were a couple of people who received their doctoral or had a graduate training from the Soviet Union. So they learned about American history and from the Soviet uh, Academy and returned to China. And so um, uh, Soviet publication was also a major source of information for the first uh, period. Now, the most important, the most important production of the second period uh, oh, here is the, um, uh, the third annual meeting of the AHRC, the Research Association of China on American History. So this is 1982. And uh, the most important uh, uh, result of this uh, uh, professional organization was the production of the comprehensive history of the United States, six volumes. Um, they, um, they not completely revised uh, the uh, conclusions, arguments given by Professor Huang in the first period, uh, but it provides a rather different, rather different, uh, a similar, I think I would say, in the middle ground. And uh, the reason that the Chinese historians decided to produce this six volume, uh, uh, multi volume uh, general account of the history of the United States was to, according to the two general editors, um, the, uh, Professor Liu and Professor Yang both uh, were from the first generation. And they think that we need to help uh, 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 students major, who major in US history, specialists as well as the general uh, public uh, uh, to correctly understand the United States. Now, the key word here is correctly. Correctly means in Chinese discourse, political discourse means differently, different from the traditional ideological line. And that is what it meant. But since no scholar, uh, no single scholar or institution uh, uh, would be able to accomplish this task, so the AHRAC decided to divide the labor among six universities, each being responsible for producing one volume. So the first, uh, the, the each one, as you can see, I know uh, some of you do not read in Chinese, but the first volume deals with the, the funding period from 18, 1585 to 1775. Second volume deal with the uh, War of Independence and the earlier Republican period. And the third volume is on Civil War and the Gilded Age. Fourth volume on the Industrial Age and the Progress of the Era. And the fifth volume dealing with the uh, uh, Great Depression, Second World War, and the last volume dealing with the contemporary uh, US history. So they have some, uh, uh, I will cite some of the uh, conclusions. So for example, uh, on the War of Independence, the sixth volume would say, the most important and greatest outcome of the War of Independence was now 
the production of the initial common national uh, consciousness. The revolution had eliminated the colonial government, rejected the traditional monarchy and aristocratic rule, and implemented a polity of bourgeois republicanism that provided to a degree popular sovereignty and prevented the tyranny. The post-independence United States was the first genuine democratic nation that implemented the bourgeois republicanism. So this was a significant revision from uh, the previous interpretation. The constitution was still perceived as a typical bourgeois document whose ultimate purpose was to protect the private property over which the nationalists and the state writers had no quarrel. But politically, it represented the legalization of the democratic outcome achieved by the American Revolution and the codification of the democratic principles as revealed in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, so continue to use bourgeois, but emphasize on democratic republicanism. Lincoln, Lincoln was extravagantly, uh, extravagantly praised for his beliefs in bourgeois democratism, but he was still a political representative of a bourgeoisie who suffered from his own limitations. But the most radical revision could be found in the shift of a project's ideological position. The project retained part of the traditional interpretation and that the United States was a country dominated by a bourgeois class, but it also portrayed the United States as a successful model uh, of economic modernization capable of self-reform. So this is a major revision of Lenin's prediction of the United States as an imperialistic bourgeois country will have a natural death and uh, corrupted at the natural death. But the Chinese historians during this period of time began to revise that. So the subtle switch illustrated the theme, the dilemma of Chinese Americanists who were trying to find an alternative perspective or to approach US history. Ultimately, the nation's commitment to modernization and to the change the nature of US China relations had lent a hopeful hand to the scholars in their search for a usable ideological locus. The new perspective, of course, were, uh, 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 was uh, unitarian and pragmatic by nature, but it critically helped the field to grow. As a result, the field expanded and included many subjects that had never been part of the study before. The expansion began understandably in uh, economic history, but quickly expanded to other new subjects, such as urban history and the his history of the American West and, uh, uh, um, and the history of women. The second period that witnessed also a surge of the uh, academic publication uh, uh, and um, uh, this was done by two tier research forces. Um, the first tier included some members from the first generation of Americanists and those who studied in the Soviet Union and China before the Cultural Revolution. The second tier included those who received the graduate training uh, in 1980s and early 1990s, and they took part uh, in writing the comprehensive history of the United States. Now, um, according to one research between 1979 and 1989, about 820 articles on US history were published. Uh, but this number were near, uh, was uh, nearly doubled in the next decade. Uh, from 1978 to 1988, 17 monographs uh, was uh, published. Uh, on U.S. history, but in the next decade, more than 80 uh, uh, volumes were published. Now, the high school textbooks and were also revised 
and uh, uh, basically giving a uh, much more positive portrayal of the United States, but still regard the United States essentially as a competitor with the politics, and even with the gradual liberalization still at a lot of So I'm going to el eliminate a part of uh, my talk because I see my time is running out. Um, um, uh, the, 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 there was a, a very interesting debate uh, during this period of time. I recently uh, published an article on the Civil War history, which document uh, a, a great in a great detail about the Chinese historians debate about how how should we evaluate Lincoln and his role in uh, emancipation of slaves. Now the third period to start in two thousand one. And until today, now the perspective uh, 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 also changed during this period of time, and uh, the research mentality. This is largely because this a new generation of graduate students and began to uh, come to the fore, you know, to become faculty members and uh, um, um, to teach, and uh, their training was done mostly in uh, late 1990s and the early, the first decade of the uh, 21st century. So they began to envision the United States no longer as an uh, archman enemy or as a model uh, for uh, modernization. They began to adopt a more contemporary uh, American uh, perspective. I mean, a mere, uh, perspective that is uh, uh, also popular in the United States. Now, to look at the uh, American experience, not as an exceptional, but as a unique. Unique, but not exceptional. So it's a nation among nations. And there were more direct and increased uh, exchanges among the um, American historians, uh, uh, US Americanists, and the Chinese uh, Americanists. Um, many graduate students uh, received a much better training uh, because the uh, graduate training in China was also more formalized, uh, professionalized in the last 20 years. And I remember, I still remember uh, when I first uh, went to uh, Peking University, you know, to give, I was a still graduate student, I gave a lecture on the uh, American historiography of reconstruction and I read uh, uh, a master thesis uh, done by a master student at Beijing University's history department. And uh, the thesis was uh, 37 pages and uh, uh, used uh, about uh, 10 sources, all second level. And uh, so that was the master thesis. That was in 1991, uh, my first time to return to China after I came to, uh, uh, since I came to the United States in 1984. And, but now, if you go to Beijing University, uh, you know, some of my own students, master students as well as doctoral students, you'll find a, 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 a tremendous difference in terms of quality, in terms of uh, 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 conceptualization of the topic and the research. And it is a largely uh, a result of a very direct, and the increased uh, exchanges. Money also speaks loudly um, because of the Fulbright scholarship that a lot of Chinese Americans were uh, invited to come to the United States. And the Fulbright had two tiers of programs, and it was a high researcher and another is a doctoral students. So the research programs invited the senior scholars who came to the United States and spent a year and returned to China and open new courses. And, uh, you know, the early uh, Chinese folk writers uh, would, uh, in their return luggage, were full of books or printed materials uh, because in China they would not be able to have access to uh, the primary sources. The enormous amount of American scholarship uh, uh, was produced annually in the United States. Um, uh, so whoever had the chance to be a Fulbrighter uh, would be able to bring uh, knowledge back to China. And this was all before digital revolution. 
And uh, after that, of course, it's an entirely different story. Now, um, the uh, graduate students in China also now when they do the doctoral dissertation, uh, they have to come to the United States to do field research, uh, to go into the archives and uh, uh, to go to not only uh, Library for Congress, but some even very local state uh, historical genealogy societies. And some of them uh, uh, have reached that, that level. And uh, uh, of course, the digital revolution uh, helped to change uh, uh, the situation in the Library of Congress and a number of universities, especially the University of North Carolina, had provided uh, uh, a digital information about Southern history. And the Yale Law School, Cornell Law School, provides the legal documents, the full documentation of the Supreme Court cases. Uh, um, I, um, I think uh, two years ago, um, my last doctoral degree student graduated from Beijing University. He used the archives, uh, his, his studies on the history of American religion and the grassroots civic organizations. So he used the archives from the headquarters of American religion in Indianapolis. Uh, and, uh, and he was the first uh, um, foreigner uh, really to use uh, American religion's archives. So, so digital revolution, the, the, I mean, the reason that he got interested in that because he read in China uh, uh, about uh, uh, the religion's uh, archives, but he could not access it. He had to come to the United States. The reason he, uh, the, he's a financial sponsor for coming to the United States is uh, um, the, uh, the Chinese uh, Scholarship Fund, which is a state uh, financed uh, study abroad uh, program. Now, again, the professional organization in this country, in the United States, provided a vital support for this period. Uh, uh, I want to particularly mention uh, the program is the Organization of American Historians and the Chinese Research Association of American History called the China uh, Initiative. And uh, uh, this is a, a recent meeting. You can say Asia, RAC grow very fast, about 450 members. Now, uh, I don't know how many of them are truly uh, uh, Americanists or can be called Americanists. But this is uh, one of the uh, recent uh, annual meeting uh, group photographs. Um, I want to mention a few uh, uh, American historians who made a substantial contribution to the new study uh, of US history in China. And uh, again, you know, this is a transnational link. Uh, flow or sharing knowledge, I think it's very important. Uh, Alan Krug, uh, Kulikov, I met him uh, when I, uh, uh, before I went back to uh, Peking University, he was a, he is the historian, a major historian of American slavery, uh, Virginia. Uh, uh, he's now teaching at the University of Georgia. Uh, uh, he taught uh, a year and Nankai University and uh, implement a very rigorous graduate training program uh, uh, for Chinese students. And in truth, he also organized uh, a major conference inviting 40 Americanists uh, uh, to come to China to talk about uh, uh, the early American history because Alan himself is an early Americanist. Michael Zuckerman from the University of Pennsylvania, a major figure uh, in the study of New England, uh, Middle Colonies. And uh, he went to uh, Fudan University, Peking University, uh, to conduct the seminars. And uh, uh, um, Zuckerman was a student of Bailey, Bernard Bailey from Harvard. And uh, Zuckerman basically was the opposite. Uh, to Bailey, you know, introduce the new history from bottoms up. And uh, he also uh, uh, gave all his books on early American history to Fudan University. 
And in the middle is my advisor, Eric Foner. Foner visited China twice, first in 2000, uh, recently in 2017. And not only his books influenced China, but a lot of his seminars also influenced uh, the uh, new generations of the Chinese Americanists. Uh, recently, I, I think it, not recently, uh, in two times, Foner, uh, before he retired, uh, he donated his more than 4,000 books on 19th century American history to Peking University. Now, I want to particularly mention the last two. Don Worcester, some of you probably know him, is the founding member of American Environmental History. He taught at Brandeis, Princeton, and the University of Kansas. After he retired, he went to China to teach at the People's University and uh, donated his books. He single-handedly uh, started American Environmental History Study uh, in China. Now, he had a big uh, uh, group of followers. Now, Alice Kessler Harris, uh, uh, very much like a foreigner who was the uh, uh, previous uh, uh, past president of OAH. And she initiated the China Initiative, Pro uh, initiative Program. She, she herself, um, Professor Harris, is a labor historian, women historian, women's history historian, and uh, she, when she became the president of OAH, and uh, she decided to launch a China residence program, and she received a grant from Ford Foundation twice, and uh, uh, a lot of money to begin the program. What this program does is that uh, every year that uh, uh, the program will be invited three uh, Americanists to go to China to teach a summer institute for a month. And uh, then the program would sponsor three Chinese uh, graduates or new faculty, junior faculty or graduate students to come to the United States to attend OAH meeting, annual meeting and also to conduct the archive researches. So here are the Americanists, US Americanists who actually went to China and taught in China uh, in six years. And these are the, um, these are the, um, um, some of the photographs of the, um, their summer institutes, so on and so forth. Now, um, just a, a glimpse of what all this means. And this is Eric Foner. He was invited uh, to Beijing University to give a lecture that the Chinese American is to honor him to uh, hold a conference and on 19th century American history. Oh, by the way, this background is the original history department of Beijing University. And these are some of the papers. Uh, I just want to use this as a sample to show you the, the sharp, the, 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 the uh, sharp difference, the contrast between uh, the first generation and the new generation, the third generation. These are some of the titles of the paper presented in the conference in English. Now, the, the topics would be uh, construction of American citizen status, uh, 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 popular sovereignty, and uh, during the Dole War, party politics in New York State, and uh, 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 conflicts uh, caused by business corporations, transcontinental uh, trans railroads, abolitionist movement, public health reform in New York City, politics of government statistics, uh, uh, and the rubber uh, uh, lawfulet machine, and the free love movement, and the social political transformation in Victoria, America, San Francisco, Chinatown, earthquake, American public housing. So it's very detailed, very specific. Uh, Foner, in commenting on this paper, he said, if you cover the names of the author of this paper, they can be easily mistaken as a graduate student's paper or junior scholar's paper uh, saying, in American academia, right? 
So uh, I want to conclude. I'm sorry, I probably run over time. Dr. Jim told me you should speak uh, uh, for about 50 minutes. So I'm just going to quickly wrap up a few uh, with a few observations. So the uh, the really the China study, Chinese study of American history is a very young field, formally started launched in 1980. But it's a very fast growing field. And the uh, third period actually benefited from the first two periods. We noticed that the full uh, original American system had all lived a very long life. And uh, three of them, uh, two, of, two of them over 100 years old, and uh, the other two over 90. And this is a very fortunate because uh, China uh, had all this uh, customer of reverence to the senior scholars. And they were also, although in the first half of their career, they were either become a political tool or, 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 or how to serve the ideology. But once the opportunity came, they seized the opportunity uh, uh, to initiate, to uh, reinvent. Uh, the field. So they uh, hope to uh, educate the first two generations of new graduate students. And it, uh, I would, uh, I cannot emphasize more uh, uh, about the importance of a sustainable bilateral exchange. That's why I devote most of my time to talking about this exchange. But the challenges, there are challenges of how this field is going to develop. Uh, first, uh, there was uh, institutional challenges, human resources, because uh, for all what I've talked about, the field of American history in the entire map, academic map of China is a still very small field, uh, uh, not comparable to the China study field in the United States, no. Secondly, it's intellectual. Intellectual largely means the access to resources, historiography, that means the Chinese students that have to catch up with the American historiography, which is being produced on a daily basis. Methodology is a major challenge. Uh, uh, you know, most of the Chinese students uh, uh, now can have access, can understand, can do the interpretation research, but how do you develop a, 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 uh, a innovative conceptualization how do you put your research together and uh, uh, deliver them uh, in a, a groundbreaking uh, uh, conceptualization work? That's a still a challenge. Originality, uh, I think. This is related to my third point, the political challenge. Uh, there has been a lot of conversation because every Chinese who study American history would always ask himself or herself two questions. One is, uh, uh, why do I study U.S. history? Second is, uh, how do I study U.S. history? You know, the first question is very easy to, un uh, to answer. Job, academic interests, uh, uh, U.S.-China relationship. But the second question is mostly by far, you know, borrowing and uh, copying. And I think that's the, that's the feature of the, some of the earlier stage. But now people began to enter to the period of creation. And, but there was also concern about uh, the Chinese American business. You know, no matter how good you are, you probably would uh, function as a middleman um, by transmitting the knowledge produced in the United States um, back to China and deliver them written in Chinese language to the Chinese audience. And so there was a fear of what the one Chinese historian called academic colonialism. And uh, uh, there was a huge debate about uh, uh, which is a Chinese way, I don't know how to translate it into, China, uh, into English, uh, localized or customized American history knowledge according to the Chinese uh, uh, understanding circumstances. So those are the concerns uh, 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 challenges uh, lying ahead, um, and and also very importantly, depending on how U.S. China um, goes. I ended in 2019 because that year, um, um, OAH 
and uh, uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese Association of American History had a huge celebration of the China uh, uh, Initiative Program. But a few months after that, we had a pa uh, pandemic, we have a COVID, and the bilateral exchange uh, uh, was completely shut down. Um, now the US-China relationship has come to a very low ebb. And uh, so who knows what's going to happen, but let's hope uh, that the 40 years investment by scholars, students, and the people on both countries, in both countries, will not be evaporated very quickly. Thank you.